Welcome to the CryEngine 3 SDK level design course. My name is Nick Floyd, and throughout the course, I'm going to show you the fundamentals of level design with the CryEngine 3. If you haven't done so already, you need to go to a site called crydev.net and create an account up at the top. And once you have an account created, you need to actually download the free SDK. The version that we're using right now is 3.4.5. When you click on it, it'll give you the size of the file as well as a short description. Once you have it downloaded, you need to figure out where you want to create your root game directory. I'm just going to go ahead and create it on the desktop to make it easy to find. So you need to create a new folder and then name it accordingly. I'm just going to call it CryEngine3SDK. And then once you have that folder named, you're going to want to drag the zip file into the folder that you had just created. And go ahead and open it up. And then you need to use your favorite zip program. I use 7-zip. You can also use WinZip or WinRAR. But you need to extract the files to this folder. Now, I'm going to go ahead and extract them here. And this is going to take a minute, so I'm going to skip ahead. And once it's done unpacking, there's a few folders in here that we want to discuss. First and foremost is the bin32 and the bin64 folder, which hold the editor and the launcher for the 32-bit and the 64-bit versions. And then another folder we want to look at is going to be the actual game folder. This is where all of the actual assets for the game, such as sounds and objects and music, are stored. You can open up these files by right-clicking opening them as archive as well using 7-zip. And then the next thing that we want to go ahead and do is we want to open up the actual code for the engine itself. We want to get that set up. You're going to need Visual Studio C++ in order to do this. So if you don't have it, you need to head over to Microsoft and get a free version of it. But once you have it open, you can open up this game code only file and it will open up inside of Visual Studio Express. If it asks you to update, go ahead and hit update. But the newer version of the CryEngine doesn't really throw any errors in Visual Studio 2012, so I'm not going to cover any extra errors that will be popping up here. It seems to be worked out now. Now, you'll see at the bottom that everything is still loading up, and that can take a minute, but that's okay. The next thing we need to go ahead and do is actually get Visual Studio set up to start working properly with the engine. You'll see off to the right, you'll see Cry Action, Cry Game, and Cry Scripts. The only folder that you're going to really want to work with whenever you come looking at the C and wanting to edit it is the Cry Game directory. We're not going to cover a whole lot of C editing in this particular course, but it is good to know where everything is and how it's set up so you get a better understanding of what you're changing when you're actually working within the engine. So go ahead and open up the Cry game, take a look at everything that's in there, but you're going to want to right click on it and go to properties. And then in here under output directory, you need to go ahead and select whichever launcher and editor that you plan on using. I plan on using the 64-bit version, so I'm going to browse to my game directory on the desktop, open up the bin64 folder, and it will automatically assign it. Then you need to go over to debugging on the right, and do the same for command. Except, after you choose the 64-bit folder, you're going to want to also select the 64-bit launcher. And that allows you to debug whatever changes you make using that launcher.exe. Go ahead and hit apply and OK. Now at this point you want to go ahead and actually hop into a level and see what this engine is capable of. You can do that by going to debug and start new instance right here. Or you can exit out of Visual Studio. And go ahead and save any changes that you might have made. And then you can actually double click on the launcher.exe yourself and it will load up the level that comes with the free SDK. Now, as it loads up, it's going to ask you to sign in using the same login that you created at crydev.net. So go ahead and log in with that. And it'll immediately take you to the game menu. 
Go ahead and select a single player and then forest. And it'll take a second to load. But this is the free level that comes with the SDK to essentially give you an idea of how a level would be set up inside of the engine. We'll go ahead and play around in here and see what you can do. In the next level, we'll go ahead, start opening up the editor itself and creating all of this that you see. In this video, we're going to be opening up the CryEngine 3's editor for the very first time. Depending on what kind of system you have, you're either going to want to look in the bin32 or the bin64 folder for the editor executable. I personally use a 64-bit system, so I'm going to look in the bin64 folder and open up the editor.exe that's in there. And once it opens and finishes loading, you're going to come up to a login prompt. Once again, you're going to log in using the same credentials that you created at crydev.net. And then go ahead and hit login. Another tip. The login info is actually stored in your registry rather than in the engine's main file. So if you delete the main file and you have to redownload a new version, your login info is still in there. But once you have it open, you're going to see something like this. You'll see the black in the middle. That's where the game level would normally take place. You'll see the console down at the bottom, which pretty much logs everything that goes on inside the engine. And you'll have the roll-up bar on the right. And notice that all of these windows and all of these sections inside the editor are editable, essentially, or resizable. You can move them up and down, and the viewport will automatically scale. Some of the more important links at the top, you have your file, which allows you to open up projects and save them. You got your config spec, which allows you to set the parameters at which the engine sh displays everything on the screen. And you could set that higher if you got a more powerful system. And then all of the editors and tools that come with the engine is located underneath view and then open view pane. And you'll see a big long list of all the different editors and tools. Uh, we'll go into further depth into all of these later on. Uh, you'll also see some hot links or some shortcuts essentially at the very top of the editor for a lot of those tools. Now the roll-up bar in particular, and we're going to be using this quite a bit as that's one of the main windows that you will be working from. You have your objects, you have your environment, you got what you can actually display and filter out on the screen, and you got your level layers. You'll notice that with this roll-up bar, you could pull it out and then place it in other parts of the engine. You could place it along the top or along the very left-hand side, and it'll snap to and auto-fit. And you can do this with all of the tools such as the time of day editor or the flow graph editor that allows you to streamline the editor for your particular project once you uh, have everything set up with the roll-up bar and with the other tools that you may want uh, you'll find that you'll continuously go along and add and remove the tools from the view and that allows you to do it relatively quickly another thing that you need to familiarize yourself with is what's called console variables they'll be referred to as cvars a lot but you'll see there's a giant long list, and this changes all of the parameters of the engine itself. Now, there's no way I could cover them all personally with you, but if you look in the engine's manual, it'll have a function for and an instruction set for each one of these variables that are listed. In the next video, I'm going to be showing you how to install plugins and work with other programs that work with the engine. In this video, we're going to move away from the editor and talk about some of the other programs that are used in conjunction with the CryEngine 3. Now this is by no means a full list of the programs that can be used. It is just the list of programs that are supported by Crytek. And we're going to first go over the 3D modeling programs. The main one that's used is 3DS Max, created by Autodesk. That's where you would go through and create all of your 3D models and animations for those models. It's a fairly expensive program though. Another one made by the same company is Maya. I find that Maya is a bit better used for creating characters than uh, hard surface objects. Another one that's good to use is Google SketchUp, and they actually have a free version that's available that some people's had some success with in getting objects over to the engine. Another set of programs that are used is going to be like your art and drawing programs. That's what you're going to use to create textures and particles. The main one that's used is Photoshop. That primarily has all of the plugins that Crytek puts out is for Photoshop. But once again, that's a fairly expensive product. Another one that's used is Flash. 
but that's going to be used to create all the heads-up displays and menus. And then you can always rely on good old Microsoft Paint for one, it's free with Windows, and you can get quite a bit done, or at least a lot more than what you would think. To install the plugins for these programs, you're going to want to browse to the Tools file inside of your game's root directory. You'll see a bunch of different files in here. Uh, for instance, if you go through to the CryMax tools, you'll see a copy to Max batch file. If you double click on that, it's going to have you enter in the drive letter for your 3ds Max installation. Mine's on the C. I hit it and it immediately copies all of the proper files to the proper spots over in 3ds Max. The same is almost done for Photoshop, except you have your 32 bit plugins and your 64-bit plugins, and depending on the version that you have installed, that's the version that you're going to want to copy over. I use the 64-bit version, and you're going to want to place that in your C drive, program files, Adobe CS 564-bit plugins, and 3D engines, and copy those files over, and then that will give you the ability to export from Photoshop. In the next video, we're going to be discussing how to create your terrain and your landmass for the first time inside of your level. Welcome to Section 2 of the CryEngine 3 SDK Level Design Course. In this section, we're going to talk about the generation and decoration of your terrain. To start off, go up to File, and then click on New. It's going to ask you to name your level. Throughout the course of these videos, I'm going to be working on the same level, and we're just going to call it Level 1 and then go ahead and hit OK at the bottom. A new one is going to pop up asking you to select a project. You really don't have to worry about this until you want to share your levels with others on crydev.net. And then go ahead and hit OK at the bottom of Generate Surface Texture. And once that orange bar at the bottom of the editor is downloading, it should take you into an empty level with nothing but water. Go ahead and go up to the Terrain menu at the top of the editor, and then click on Edit Terrain. This is going to bring up the Terrain Editor. It'll give you a mini-map level here on the left. The easiest way to generate terrain is to go up to Tools and hit Generate Terrain. But first, we want to actually set the terrain max height so you don't get these massive mountains. We're going to go ahead and set this to 30. Now, one thing to keep in mind is it doesn't start the height from the top of the water. It starts from the bottom of the water. And 30 should give us some terrain right above the surface of the water. You'll get some settings here that you can adjust for the noise and amplitude of the terrain, but go ahead and just hit OK at the bottom. You should get something like this. This is really good for prototyping. Say you wanted to test out some scripts or some models that you're wanting to try to import into the engine. You can generate a really quick terrain by doing this. But we want to discuss a couple of other ways on how to get a terrain in your level. Go ahead and go up to Edit Terrain, and Modify, and Erase Terrain. That'll get rid of the terrain that's in there now. And next, we're going to import what's called a height map. Now, a height map is a black and white image that represents the height of the level. The first height map we're going to import is just going to be a small 256 by 256 bitmap image. We're also going to set the max height up to 80. That way we can get a bit more definition in the mountains and everything that comes in that bitmap. Now I'm keeping these images stored under game, levels, level 1, and then you see the two bitmaps here. Now I'm going to refer to this folder quite often so you may want to remember where that is in your set of folders. But here's the low res bitmap and you can tell as it loads in it's really blocky. You see a lot of these squares everywhere. That's because it's using a really low resolution image. Now, we can kind of fix this if you go up to Terrain, Edit Terrain, Modify, and then Smooth Slope. And it'll even out the terrain between the, the high points and the valleys and smooth everything out. It's a good way to fix a really low res height map like that. Now let's go ahead and see what a high res height map would look like. Well, a higher res. The next bitmap we're going to use is going to be a 512 by 512 image versus the 256 that we had just loaded in. And as you can tell, everything such as the 
valleys and the mountains are a bit more defined. It's still quite spiky, but you can get even higher resolution images to fix that. And you'll notice that if we hit smooth slope, it gives you essentially the exact same peaks and valleys that you had whenever you had the lower resolution terrain. Now, one of the common problems that people run into when they're very first generating their terrain is they get stuck underneath the terrain and that you may not recognize that you're underneath the terrain until you see it for the first time. So I'm going to go ahead and delete the terrain that we have in here now. And then I'm going to move the camera really close to the water. And then I'm going to generate that terrain again. So theoretically, I should be underneath the terrain when it's generated. And you'll notice how the entire level looks messed up. Now, it automatically popped me out to the side, which the CryEngine has been getting better about. But a lot of times you may not get popped out to the side. So you'll have to move your camera up or down until you find yourself above the terrain in which everything starts normal again. In the next video, I'm going to show you how to further detail the terrain so you can perfect your height map that you had loaded into the level. In this video, I'm going to show you how to use the tools needed to detail the terrain mass that you had created in the last video. I'm going to go ahead and use the same height map that we had shown you in the last video. And the first thing that we're going to test out is what's called the flatten brush. To get there, go up to the Environment tab in the roll-up bar and click on Modify. And you'll see the Flatten button here under Modify Terrain. One of the first things you need to set when using the Flatten brush is the height, as that is the height at which it will flatten the terrain too. There's a yellow line along the z-axis that gives you a visual indication of how high the terrain will be set to. I will just go ahead and set this up at 58 for now. Then as you notice, as I mouse around the terrain, it sinks the terrain down to that height. But it would take forever to do this giant landmass with that little brush. So we're going to increase the outside radius, which as you can see, will increase the green circle that is circling the mouse right now. That is the area in which the terrain will be affected. As you notice, as I mouse around this entire island, it affects all of the terrain that's in that circle. It allows you to do large amounts of terrain all at once. Now one thing to keep in mind when using the flatten tool and adjusting the height is that it measures the height from the sea floor rather than sea level. So if you adjust the height to say 5 or 10, you're probably not going to see it because it's still going to be submerged underwater. Now another very useful tool when detailing the terrain is the raise and lower brush. Just like the flatten tool, you can adjust the height here, except you can adjust it into the negative to lower the terrain. And as you can tell, I set it at 1, and I mouse over the terrain and click, and it'll start raising the terrain here. You can adjust the height, and it'll raise the terrain by large amounts at a time. Now, unlike the flatten tool, this takes the height from the terrain that you're moused over currently, not from either sea level or the sea floor. And then you also have the smooth tool, which takes the average between the highest point and the lowest point within the green circle and tries to match the terrain between it, essentially smoothing the terrain out, as you can see. Uh, one way to get a more smooth result over a large amount of land is to increase the outside radius. And as you can tell, it really starts to smooth it out as I even enlarge the circle just a little bit. Now I'm going to continue to work, but I'm going to speed up the video so you can get a general idea of how one would go about detailing large amounts of terrain at once. I'm also going to take this time to point out that you need to save often. You may not see me save during these videos. Trust that I am saving very often as the editor will crash on you sometimes and can't be avoided. And so you're going to be glad that you save often. While you're detailing the terrain, as you see that I'm doing here, you may notice slight rips or tears in the actual mesh of the terrain. You can't leave those in the final product of the level. Those have to be adjusted out. Whether you raise or lower the terrain or have to smooth it out, you have to be sure that you can get rid of those. Now, we're going to slow the video back down. And I'm going to create what's called a road, because you can actually create the terrain around a road after you place it. You go to miscellaneous and then down to road. 
And once you have the road selected, you need to find the point in the level in which you would like to start the road, and then click. And you'll see this red line, and you can continue to click and trace the red line where you want to go, and this will be the start of your road. Now each time that you place a waypoint for the road, that will allow you to create a bend in the road, either going left or right, or up or down. And I'll show you why here in a minute, why it's important to create waypoints vertically as well as for horizontal bends. Now go ahead and extend the road all the way out to its final point. And once you're happy where the road would end, you will double click to finish the road. And then it'll stop following your mouse. Now you probably noticed as you were creating that road that it was comprised of two different layers. You have the bottom layer, which it shows the red replace me, which a comprise of the actual material that shows the road itself. And then you have the blue mesh that's on top of it, and that is the height map of the road. The more waypoints that you place on a hill, the closer that you'll notice this height map follows the hill itself. And I'll show you why that's important. But first, we need to go ahead and get a material on this road. To do that, you're going to look on the right hand side inside the roll-up bar where it says MTL and it says no custom material and click on that. And that'll bring up the material editor. Now we're going to go quite a bit more in depth in this in some future videos, so don't worry too much for now. But go ahead and go to terrain and then to roads. And we're going to go ahead and use forest, trail, mud, dark. Now once you've got that selected, the only thing you have to do is click on the very top left button where it says assign item to selected object. And after you click that, you'll notice that the red replace me's are gone and it's actually got a material for the road itself. Now you'll notice this blue mesh is still there. In order to use that, we want to scroll down on the roll-up bar and then select Align Height Map. And this is why I said you can actually design the terrain around a road, because as you notice, the terrain moves either up or down to fit with this blue mesh that you had created. Now you'll notice at each one of these waypoints, I could have created more of these to not slice into these hills as much, but for this particular level, I'm a big fan of the cliff look, as this is going to end up being a forest level. And you'll notice as I follow the road all the way back, you can now see the blue mesh and it doesn't intersect the terrain at any given point. You also see at this end point that the material of the road fades off so it can blend better with the rest of the level. And now if you go to the road parameters, you can adjust the road width until you're happy with the actual width of the road. And that not only does that increase the blue mesh that sits on top of the road, but it also increases the actual material itself. And it's because of the road's ability to directly affect the terrain that I like to create it first before putting a lot of detail into the terrain. Now we're going to skip to a different part of the level here, and we're going to show you how to create either a pond or a lake. You're going to want to go up to Area inside of the roll-up bar, and then click on Water Volume. Now, whenever you go to click on the terrain, you're going to want to find a nice basin-like part of it so pond can actually sit in there properly. And as you click around the edge of the basin, you'll notice a red line with some blue dots being placed. You're going to want to place the red line with the blue dots all around the edge where the lake would be. And you'll also notice a black grid below it all. That's going to be where the actual surface of the water will lie. You'll notice it's sitting a little bit below where the red line and blue dots are. That allows you to actually place it the outside of the terrain technically but you'll notice how this black grid meets up with the terrain as i place it a little bit above now it doesn't have to be perfect you can place these dots pretty haphazardly but notice how as i go through i actually complete the entire circle and whenever you're done placing all these blue dots just double click on the last one and that will complete your pond now it's not going to show much of anything except for this black grid until we actually assign it a material. So just like the road, click on where it says no custom material. And once again, that'll bring up the material editor. Go ahead and click on materials and then open up ocean. And then we're going to use lake one. So go ahead and select it and then click on the assign item to selected object. As we move this out of the way, you'll notice that the lake actually has water in it now. As we click away from the lake, the black grid will go away. 
every single time you create a body of water like this, you're going to want to make sure that you don't have any gaps and that this blue line actually covers the edge of the lake. If not, you will have water just floating out in the middle of nowhere and it can stand out very badly in the level. And once you're happy with your lake, go ahead and go around and finish detailing your terrain. And in the next video, I'll show you how to add color and materials to the terrain itself. In this video, I'm going to show you how to add textures and materials to the terrain that you had detailed on the last level, as well as the difference between the two. To start off, go up to the terrain menu at the top, and then click on texture. This will open up the terrain texture layers. You'll see the layers on the right, and then you can add them from the layer tasks, as well as select and delete them. Now, the difference between a layer and the texture that you may see down here at the bottom left is dependent on your view of the terrain itself. Now you'll notice as we zoom way out of the terrain, you'll see this grid pattern. And that is the texture layer that you're seeing on the bottom left. Now if you zoom way in, you'll see that same grid pattern repeated. And this is the material that you see loaded into the layer on the right. You only see the material whenever you're zoomed in close to the terrain. If you look at the terrain in the distance, you will see the actual layer that's listed on the left. Now, the layer itself we're going to actually paint rather than trying to come up with a very large texture over the entire terrain. To start, first off, go ahead and go to the layer painter in the environment in the roll up bar, and you'll see default listed there as well as default listed in the layers. We're going to change the name of this to grass. And then you'll see it change in the roll up bar, and then we need to change the layer texture. For now, go to Textures, and then Defaults, and then pick Gray.DDS. I'll show you why you pick Gray in a minute. But then we also need to pick the new material. So go ahead and click on the link for the material, and it'll open up the Materials Editor for you. And we're going to use Terrain, and then Grass 1 and then hit Assign Material under Layer Tasks, and it'll add the material to your layer. Now, we're ready to go ahead and paint this onto the terrain directly. You can pick a color off to the right. We're gonna pick a nice vibrant green since it's a forest grass layer. Now, by picking that color off to the right, you're essentially overriding that gray texture that you had picked before. And then you'll see how eventually, as you lay the texture down, you can paint it on the terrain. You need to find yourself a nice empty spot on the terrain and just start clicking and dragging. And you'll notice how it starts covering the terrain with the layer that you have selected. You can increase the radius of the brush and get a nice larger and smoother coat. Now, you can also pick a different color and then layer the colors on top of it. And this is what I mean by painting the terrain. You'll notice as you go through and paint different styles of grass at different areas, you're going to eventually pick different colors over and over. And then it gives you more of a unique look as you go through and decorate every piece of the terrain with different layers. Now, one easy way that you can coat an entire island is by scrolling all the way out, increasing the radius of the brush, as you see here, and then just clicking and dragging. Now your computer's going to slow down a little bit, and that's okay because it takes a bit of processing power to do this. But go ahead and go around and paint the entire island. It's a good idea to do this as you don't want to leave that graph texture that was originally on the terrain. Now, once you have the entire terrain covered, we're going to show you how to create a new layer so you can start working on things like cliffs and beaches and rocks and sand. To do that, go ahead and open up the terrain texture layers once more and then click add layer. Now we're going to rename this new layer to cliff. And then once again we're going to pick the texture layer. We're going to pick the same gray.dds inside of the defaults folder. You can technically pick white but the colors that you try to paint with are way too vibrant and they don't look very real. We find that gray and even Crytek re recommends that you use this gray.dds as it gives more realistic colors as you're painting. 
but we're going to use rock 4 as the material, and then remember to hit assign material under layer tasks. I'm going to go ahead and move everything out of the way, and you'll notice that it's added the cliff layer in the roll-up bar right away. Now, another way to easily paint cliffs is you can use the slope. What this does is it allows you to paint between two certain degrees, between 0 and 90 degrees on the z-axis. We're going to paint between 60 and 90, so it'll only paint on the terrain that is angled between 60 degrees and 90 degrees. And we're going to use the same really large brush so we can cover the entire island. And you'll notice as I'm painting, it only coats certain parts of the terrain, and it gives it more of a realistic feel, at least from afar. Now, we're going to go ahead and speed up the video a little bit so you can see how going through and painting the terrain can add more and more detail as you go. Another thing to keep in mind, as you're painting the terrain, you can adjust the hardness off to the right. And what that does is, is it allows you to blend two layers together. Now, one thing to remember, as you see here, if you're having troubles painting over terrain, or over a layer, make sure that you change your slope back to zero or your altitude. And we're going to go ahead and create a new layer, and then we're going to slow this down for the beach layer, as I'm going to show you a different way again to paint. Go ahead and select your new layer, and then off to the right above the slope, you'll see altitude. Now we're going to go ahead and set this up from 1024 to 20, and that means that we're only going to be able to paint between 0, which is at the sea floor, to 20 units up. As you can tell, as I move my green circle around, it doesn't paint above the certain line on the terrain. This is really good for beaches um, along the water. Now, while these tricks reduce the amount of time it takes to paint the terrain, it's still going to take you a while to properly do it, as you're going to find that you're going to make several passes over the same amount of terrain over and over. And each time here, we're going to pick a different color, and ultimately, that's what's going to give you a very unique and natural look. In the next video, I'm going to show you how to add plants, flora, and rocks to your level to give it a more lifelike look. Here, we're going to discuss what's called the vegetation tool. The name itself is kind of misleading, as it doesn't allow you to only place plants. It allows you to place things like rocks and rubble as well. You're going to want to find a clear spot where you're going to want to place uh, some trees. And then go to the roll-up bar, and then click on Environment, and then Vegetation. Now, you're going to want to click at the very top left where it says Add Vegetation Object. And it'll open up a menu. All of the trees and plants are located under the Natural folder to the left, and then under Trees. And then you can pick various trees from here. We're going to use Jungle Tree Thin B. Now you'll see it appear down underneath objects. When you select it, the dot next to it will turn red, and you'll see a bunch of options appear below, beneath it. A lot of these options depend on the object you have loaded, such as bending, which will allow it to bend in the wind. You also have some other objects, such as align to terrain and use terrain color, which you can play around with, but most of the time you want to leave it turned off. Go ahead and select the object, and like I said, make sure the dot next to it is red, and then select the paint objects at the top. And then as you drag your cursor along the terrain, you'll notice that it paints the vegetation directly on. Now, you can go ahead and increase the brush radius and cover large amounts of terrain at a time. But as you can tell, you get some kind of weird results when you do that. Now, you can hit Control z at any given point whenever you mess up on your keyboard, and it will essentially undo the last thing that you did. Now, on the options, whenever you turn the density up, that is kind of misleading as by putting the number up, you actually get less floor. Because whenever you increase the number, it actually increases the distance between each object that's placed on the terrain. I usually find that a density of two works pretty well in a jungle type setting. Now, we're going to want to add another object under the same category where it says default. To do that, you can go ahead and right click in the blank part of objects, and then select add object. It'll bring up that same menu as before, and we're gonna add that other jungle thin tree, the jungle thin tree G. 
and you'll notice that both of them are placed under the default. And you can select each one individually or both of them together to paint them both at the same time on top of the terrain. Now you'll notice even though you've got both of them being painted at once and there's two different species, it looks rather unnatural and bland as everything's the same size. And I'll show you a way to fix that really quick. But first, notice that whenever you have both items selected, you cannot set any options. The only time you can set options inside of the vegetation tool for the object is when you only have one object selected at a time. And you'll notice here the elevation min and elevation max and slope min and slope max. Those work the same way as painting the terrain did as I showed you in the last video. You'll also notice some things like cast shadow. If you check it, you'll notice here the trees actually cast a shadow according to the sun. I would be very careful with that as that can really slow down the level of the machine that you're working on. You'll also see here where it says use sprites. Now if you zoom out very far, you have to zoom out quite a bit. You'll notice that these trees turn into two, 2D objects. That's what's called a sprite. You can uncheck that and it won't do that, but it's really good for computer performance when you're trying to view vegetation from really far away. Now if you scroll all the way down, you can paint by terrain layer. For instance, if you check where it says grass, it'll place these trees everywhere that there's grass. I wouldn't really recommend that as you're going to have vegetation and flora popping up in weird spots that you didn't anticipate most of the time. Now we want to add another category, but first let's go ahead and rename this from default. Right click it and select rename category. We're going to call this small trees. Now right click in the objects and then select add category. And we're going to put in bushes. And then we're going to add an object to the bushes. So select the category, then right click it, and then select add object. We're going to look under natural, and then bushes, ground, oh, let's you do jungle fern. That looks better. Now, the first thing we're going to want to do here is adjust the size variation. Now what this does is it will randomize the size of the plant or the rock or whatever you're placing down. So whenever you place multiple, it gives it more of a natural feeling. I find that two works pretty well when you're working with a size of one. Now as you notice, whenever I click on the terrain and paint the bushes on, you'll see how they're different sizes. That mimics the bush through every stage of its life all the way to adulthood and gives it more of a natural look on the terrain. Now we're going to skip ahead a little bit and I'm going to show you how to manipulate single objects that have been placed by the vegetation tool. Say you are painting a bunch of trees and w just one of them got in the way, but you don't want to get rid of all the trees by hitting Control Z. Make sure that you don't have paint objects selected and then just click on the object in the game world. Then if you click on the cross arrows at the top, that will give you the helpers to actually move the object along any given axis that you select. You can also select the arrow that is in the form of a circle to rotate the object. And you can rotate them around the axis that you select with the helpers. And that works for any object that was placed by the vegetation tool. As you can see, I can move trees around as well. Now that we're getting into adding objects into our level, I want to show you where these objects are stored within the game directory. You're going to want to go to the game directory and then open up the game folder. And you'll notice these pack files. Open up the objects.pack file. I recommend, as well as Crytek recommends, using a program called 7-Zip, which you can download for free. But once you use that program to open it up, you'll see a natural folder. And it essentially uses the same hierarchy as you saw while browsing within the engine itself. You'll notice all the different files that are listed in here. Now in the next section, I will show you how to get your custom assets into the engine. But I want to make you aware of where these are stored so you can start working with them and getting familiar with them right off the bat. Now in the next video, I'm going to show you how to set up your lighting and the skies and the atmosphere for your level. Now that your terrain is starting to come alive with color and detail, I'm going to show you how to start adjusting the skies above it all. First, you want to move to a point which you can see the sky clearly, and then you'll notice it's been the same blue-gray color the whole time. Go ahead and go up to Terrain, and then click on Time of Day. You'll notice the Time of Day tool consists of three main parts. You have the tasks, you have the timeline, and you have the parameters. 
then go ahead and underneath the tasks, click the toggle advanced properties. And you'll notice a bunch more parameters on the right hand side come about. You can adjust every single one of these and every single one of these is adjustable based on the timeline itself, based on a 24 hour period as you see below. Watch as I move this slider on the sky, it'll actually change the time of the day and where the sun is in the sky as well as whether or not you can see stars, any clouds, any blueness in the atmosphere. You can also change it by clicking 0, 12, or 24 up at the top. Now clicking on the parameters on the right hand side will bring up the actual option inside of the timeline. You'll notice as I click on this it will bring up green line with yellow dots. You can also add dots by double clicking but as the day continues forward it will adjust the option accordingly based on the line that you have set here. Now whenever you click on something that asks for a color, it's not going to bring up the box with a color gradient that you're used to. It's going to bring up a red, green, blue system as you see here. Now watch as I pick the sun intensity and I move the time forward as it jumps way up right here on the graph. You'll notice that is the exact point in which the sun sets quickly. And that's why it's at such a steep angle here. With all of these options being changed throughout a 24 hour period, you can also set this to play at zero, which means that you can have a static sky. Now I'm going to go ahead and change this play speed to a high number real quick. And we're going to hop in game so you can take a look and see at how the sun actually moves while you're playing with your character. And you can always hop in game at any point by pressing control G. And you'll notice because I have it set to 20, how the sun's moving really fast through the sky. Now normal play speed is one. You can set that to zero to have a static sky. I'm gonna leave it as one so it'll switch between night and day as our player is playing. Now another very useful tool is what's called the lighting tool. And this actually lets you adjust the more physical properties of the sun rather than the color and attunement properties of the sun. You can adjust the actual sun direction and where it travels through the sky, as well as give you the ability as control where the sun will rise on the horizon itself. You can see it by adjusting the slider here. It also gives you the ability to adjust the dawn and dusk time and duration and how long it takes for the sun to move through those periods. Now, you may notice that the sky is still pretty much essentially looks the same even though we've played around with the time of day. To change that go to environment and then you'll see here under skybox you have two sets of materials. You have material and material low spec. To change either one of these you're going to want to click on the three dots that appears to the right and it'll bring up the material editor just like before. Now the difference between the two materials between material and material low spec is that one is for the time of day tool that is for a dynamic sky and the material low spec is for a static sky that simply doesn't change. Now you can add a new material to the roller bar by clicking on the arrow to the left of the three dots. You notice as I go through and click the various materials available and click the arrow it'll change the sky that's still visible on the left hand side with clouds and different color blues. Now there are a lot of options inside of the time of day tool that we didn't mention or talk about and there's just because there's too many to discuss. You can find a detailed description of all of the options that are set there inside of Crytek's manuals that they have written up for you on crydev.net. I highly suggest you look at it. Now in the next section, I'm gonna show you how to start getting your custom assets into the engine. In this section, we're gonna be discussing how to work with models inside of the CryEngine 3 editor, and then what to do with them once you've got them in there. But before we start doing that, we need to work with a little bit of file management inside of the root directory. Go ahead and open up the game folder, and you'll see a bunch of different pack files in here, like animations.pack or gamedata.pack. We want to extract all of these to this folder. I personally use a program called 7-Zip. It's free, and I recommend you use it as well. It's really easy to work with. But I use that to extract each folder to this directory. Now, the point of this being is that the engine itself will read from these unpacked files rather than the packed up ones, allowing you to create new folders and add objects to the trees within the editor itself. Now this is gonna take a little while to go through and do all of these, so I'm gonna skip ahead and show you what it looks like with everything unpacked. 
Now, once you have it all unpacked, you can go through and look through all the folders, and you'll notice that the file structure is set up essentially the same way as you see from within the editor itself. But now that you've got all this opened up, let's go ahead and take a look at the tools that is provided with the engine to work with 3D Studio Max. Now, this window to the left, you will see every single time you open 3D Studio Max if you have the tools installed. Essentially, it's to make sure that it is working properly with the engine. And you'll see down here where it says engine state. As long as that's green, that means it's found the executable for the engine and you're good to go. Now, on the command panel here, you may normally see it shrunk down to a single column like this. This is the way it's probably going to look on your screen, but I'm blowing it up here so you can see all the tools at once. Now, the model that I've created in here is a very simple one called high poly underscore sphere. Essentially, it's just a sphere with a really high poly count. I find it's really useful to have it inside the engine. You can add it to this list by either selecting the pick button and then selecting the model inside of your viewport or having the model selected and then hit add select button. Now, you'll see a drop down with various options for animated geometry or animation for CGA. We'll get into those later, but for now, let's just go ahead and pick a geometry. You'll see a couple checkboxes underneath here for export file per node and custom file name. You can check the export file per node if you have multiple objects inside of this geometry that you want to export. But once you have everything set up, just go ahead and hit export node. And it's going to bring up another window for you. Now this window may contain some errors or some warnings like mine has here. I'll have to go in and fix a couple of those vertices. but. Essentially, it did export. So once it says done, go ahead and hit close at the bottom. Now we want to go ahead and check out to see the actual file itself. So you can hit show and explore, and it will show you the actual file that it exported to. For now, I'm exporting it to a folder I created in the root directory called assets. It helps me keep things managed. Now it will always export the CGF or animation file to the same place that you have the 3ds Max file saved to. You can save those within the engine itself, but I keep it in a separate folder just to keep everything organized. Now let's go ahead and put this object inside of the engine itself so it shows up in our tree. Now go open up games, objects, and I'm going to put this in the default folder. Now I've already pasted the CGF file in here. You'll notice the max file is in here too. I do that so whenever I open up the max file, it'll automatically export the CGF to here if I need to change it. But a high polysphere I feel is a good default object to have within the engine. So we go to brush and then to default and you'll see our object in there. Now the difference between a brush and a geometric entity is geometric entities are more for scripting while brushes are more for static objects that don't move in the game. And then in the next video, we're going to dive a little bit deeper into importing your assets into the engine. In this video, we're going to talk about creating your own file structure using a model that you're importing into the engine, rather than trying to rely on the existing file structure that's currently downloaded with the engine itself. Before we start that, I want to show you a little bit about modifying these models. You'll notice that you've got various helpers along the top to either move, to rotate, or to scale your models. You'll notice that depending on what axis you have highlighted whenever you click, it will move or scale the model along that particular axis. And you'll see as well as you can have multiple axes as I have the X, Y, and Z highlighted here. And you can modify the object across all of those axes at once. Now, in the last video, I touched upon the brush and geometric entity and what the differences were. This time, we're going to drag out a geometric entity just to prove that it essentially looks the same inside of the engine. However, the big difference for the geometric entity is it allows you to script it. It allows you to write a flow graph behind it. And we will bring one out here. But first, I created another object I like to include in the engine whenever I start a new project. And that's a high polygon torus just really helpful to have inside of the engine to make various objects. Now I'm going to place this inside of the level directory, just like I did these bitmaps earlier. And by doing that, I'm going to essentially create a new tree or a new file in the tree to the right here in the browser. Now it doesn't do anything right off the bat. As soon as I load this object in, you actually have to restart the engine first. 
Now, in the future, whenever I do an engine restart, I'm just going to let you know that I'm doing it and skipping ahead. But because this is a procedure that has to be performed so often, I'm going to go ahead and run you through this real quick, just so you can see how fast the procedure is. And then we will get our level loaded up here. And then, now that we have our level loading up, whenever we click on the geometric entity off to the right, you'll see the new file listed here. Now, if you open it up, you'll see our level and then the object that we placed in there. And we can drag it in. And just like with the brush objects, a geometric entity can be moved and scaled using the helpers along each of the axis. Now, whenever creating your level, you need to decide every single object that you bring in, whether or not it's going to be used with logic behind it, or if it's just going to be a static object used in the level that the player won't use. Next, I'll show you how to work with groups of objects. Now that you've started working with custom models in your level, you may notice that it becomes a hassle to work with large amounts of models at once. I'm going to show you a few tricks to help with that. First, if you haven't discovered it already, you can highlight and select multiple models at once by dragging a box around them. I'm going to delete these models from the last video. Uh, you can either hit delete on the keyboard or go up to edit and hit delete to get rid of them. And then I'm going to go ahead and drag a few just random objects out into the level to use as an example. We'll drag in a primitive box. And then we will drag in a primitive cube. And we'll throw in another cube. And then we will throw in, say, the high poly sphere. So you can see it also works with custom assets as well. Now, one of the biggest problems you may have come across is when you're working with models and trying to select them, you may accidentally select other models in the process. As you see here, as I'm trying to select the box in the front, it selects models behind it, like the sphere and the box right behind it. To fix that, you can select the model you want to not select. Go up to edit and then hit free selection. What this does is make the model unselectable. Now you'll notice as I drag a box, it only selects the cube behind it now. And I'll select that, go up to edit, and free selection. It does the same thing. Now I can drag a box and only select the model that I want. If I want to be able to select the models again, you can go up to edit and hit unfreeze all. And then confirm that you want to unfreeze them all. And as you drag a box, I can select them all over again. Now Working with large groups, you can move them up and down all at once in unison, but they can become a pain if you accidentally unselect them. So to make large amounts of models easier to work with, you can group them together by going up to group and then hitting group. You'll want to create a name for that. I'm just going to call this random objects. And after you hit the OK button, it'll create a green box around the group of objects that you've just created. And then you can select that group and it'll act as a single model essentially you can move it up and down you can rotate it you can scale it just like you would a single model it'll move all of the objects at once and if you want to ungroup them and split them apart you just got to go to group and hit ungroup at the top and then you can start working with them like normal now another thing that may become a problem is you need to see underneath or behind a model but you don't want to move it you can select it and then hit hide selection and it will hide it as well as freeze it so you can't select it at all. And if you want to be able to view it again, go up to edit and hit unhide all and confirm that you want to unhide it. And brings it back. Now another useful trick in working with large amounts of models and trying to populate a level is to clone the models that are out there. You can select them and go up to edit, hit clone, and it will essentially create all of the objects over again in the same configuration as when you had selected them. Now notice how I cloned it, and I'll select them all over again. And then after I hit clone them, it brings back all of the objects in the same pattern and configuration that they were in when I originally cloned them. And you can keep doing that and get large amounts of objects in a level all at once. In the next video, I'm going to be showing you how to animate these objects that you're getting into the level. In the last video of this section, I want to show you how to import and start basic animations inside of your level. Importing an animation is pretty close to importing a normal object with just a couple slight variances. 
But first, I want to show you another tip that may help you inside of 3ds Max. If you don't see the CryEngine 3 button here underneath your utilities, if you, you can hit the little button here at the top, and it will give you a list of buttons that can be put over here. If you scroll to the bottom under Crytek Tools, you'll see the exporter in which you can add to your list of buttons. That'll make it available to you right, relatively quickly. But as you can see, I have a object in the export box here, and I'm going to be selecting animated geometry.cga. Essentially, it is just a keyframe-based animation that I made lasting a few seconds. But we're going to select the CGA and then hit export nodes and then wait for it to export. And then once it's done, hit close. And I had exported this to the level directory, as you can see here. And then I need to go ahead and restart the engine so that way it appears in my tree structure whenever I try to bring it into the level. We'll skip ahead to when it boots back up. Now that it's booted back up, it should be in the tree. We can drag it into the level. But as you notice, it's not really doing anything yet. It's because we have no logic behind it. There's nothing telling it to do it. However, first, we need to make sure that the animation exported correctly. So we're going to go up to the character editor underneath view. Go up to File, and then hit Open, and then select the sphere revolve.cga, and then hit Open. And it'll bring up the sphere in the viewport here, and you can move around in the viewport kind of like you can in the level. And you, if you click on the default animation off to the left, it'll start the default animation. As you can see, as the name implies, it's just a sphere that revolves. But now that we know it actually works, we can script it in. Now, notice how I selected as a geometric entity. And because I did, it gives me the flow graph option down below. We're going to go ahead and hit create flow graph, and I'm going to call this test rotation. And then it's going to bring up the flow graph editor. Now we're going to go in very deep detail into the flow graph in future sections. But for now, just follow along exactly as I make this so you can get it to work. First, go ahead and right click anywhere in here and select add start node. This essentially is a logic that gets activated at the start of the level. Then right click again, go to add node, animations, and then play animation. This is the node that will eventually activate the animation on the sphere itself. On the red bar where it says true to entity, right click it and then select add selected entity. And that will turn it blue and say graph entity. Then we need to drag an arrow from the output of the start to the start on the play animation. Then we select the animation, and then select the only animation available, which is default. And then select loop, and turn that to true, so it continuously plays over and over and over. You don't really need to change anything else in here. And essentially, the flow graph is done already. It's a very simple one. Now, all we have to do is hit Control e Control g to get into the game. And as you can see, it's working. In the next section, I'm going to show you how to get rid of all these red replace me textures and start creating your own materials within the level. In this section, we're going to be talking about materials, textures, how to create them, and how to use them inside of the editor. To start off, go ahead and click on the checkered globe at the top right, and that'll bring up the material editor. You can also go to View, Open View Pane, and then hit on Material Editor in there. Once you have the material editor open, you'll see a tree on the left-hand side with a list of all of the materials that are currently loaded inside of the CryEngine's game directory. I'm going to load up the forest, trail, mud material that we had used earlier on the road texture. Now, as you can see, there's a bunch of various settings throughout the list in the bottom underneath the actual texture itself, or the material itself. And we'll go over a lot of these here in the future. But for now, let's take a look at the diffuse color, as I want to show you how it changes the material dynamically inside of the editor. As you click on the diffuse color, it'll bring up a color slider. And you'll notice, as I move the slider up and down for the black or white, it actually changes the color of the road that's in the editor already. Now this works for pretty much all materials as all of them are dynamically changed. As soon as you change something within the editor, you'll see the change inside of the engine itself. Now let's go ahead and take a look at the actual textures that are used to create the material. A material is nothing but a mixture of these various textures that you see here, such as the diffuse, specular, and bump map. The diffuse is the most important 
what actually gives color to the material itself. If you want to change any of these textures, you can click on the three dots to the right and it'll bring up the file browser, just like you would with most other editors. You'll notice that a lot of these textures either have a lot of materials or just a few. And not all of those slots need to be filled to create a material that you would use inside of the game. For instance, if you look at Brick Wall 01, you'll notice that it's also missing the specular map here. Like I said, it's just simply not needed. Really, the only thing you need is the diffuse. Now, if you go to the game, directory you'll see the materials folder and that is where all the materials are actually stored now the textures are stored separately from the materials and a folder next to the materials folder called textures this helps you keep everything organized now in the next video i'm going to show you how to actually go through and create some of these materials yourself and then load them onto custom made objects within the engine Here we're going to discuss creating materials inside of the editor using custom textures. To start, you're going to want to go ahead and open up the material editor. But first, I'm going to drag it on an object real quick to actually put the material on. I'm going to use the high poly sphere that we had put into the engine earlier. But find yourself an object that you would like to put a material on, and then click on the material editor. And we're going to be creating a new part of the tree off to the left called Levels. So click on Add New Material at the top. And then I'm going to browse to the Levels directory inside of the game folder. And then I'm going to create the material called Test Material. Now remember to put underscores instead of spaces. You'll find that if you put spaces in a lot of your names, it'll mess you up later on down the road. But as soon as you do it, you'll notice that there's a Levels folder off to the left, and you'll have all of your basic options that you would with any other Realm material. Then we're going to want to go ahead and add our te first texture map, our Diffuse. Now, I've already created one through a free program called GIMP. Now, it's called Protective Field Alpha. And you'll see that there's black here, but that's technically not black. That's an alpha channel. And I'll show you how to use that here in a second. But Go ahead and load in your texture, and you'll see it appear at the top. And then if you click on the Apply Material button, it'll apply it to the sphere that you have selected. Now you'll notice that there's black with blue at the bottom. Now we're going to make that black disappear because it's part of the alpha channel. Now if you hit Alpha Test and just raise it up to only one, you'll notice that it'll cut it in half essentially with this material. That's because there's a gradient. And if you up the opacity just a little bit, you'll notice it makes the whole thing appear like it should. It actually makes the gradient see-through, makes it translucent. Now, you'll notice, as you can still see the sphere all the way around, if you hover over it, I mean, the sphere is still there. It's just the material is making it see-through. Now, I'm going to add a little bit of glow to it, so that way it actually stands out a little bit. Now, I'm going to be using this particular, uh, I would call it a particle, personally, but it's just a model with a translucent texture on it. But I'm going to use this particular model later on in the level. And notice that you can also adjust the colors on it just like you could anything else. Now, one thing that you need to do consistently from here on out, and you should have been doing it already, is hopping into the game on a regular basis to check out the size of everything. Now, you'll notice how on my particular level, I have the time of day going really fast. You'll see the sun zipping through the sky. That's because I would like to be able to see anything new that I place into the level under various light conditions to make sure it appears okay. Sometimes you'll notice that in, under direct light, or with no light at all, you'll get some artifacts that you may need to try to fix. Now, while the sphere looks rather bland right now, we're going to be diving into the material editor quite a bit in the next couple of videos to give this thing a bit better look and, and give it a bit more life within the level. In this video, we're going to dive a bit deeper into the texture side of materials and what they do as opposed to just give you color for the material. Now, I'm going to start off with the material that I had created in the last video. And we're going to scroll down to Texture Maps. Now, Diffuse, as I said before, gives you the color. Specular gives you the reflectivity of the material. A bump map actually bends the light reflecting off of it to give you the appearance of bumps. Environment gives you the reflection that's going to be displayed. Detail is used to give added detail on top of the texture, like an extra layer. 
opacity is no longer used, and decal almost works a bit like detail, as it gives you a material on top of the material. And the function of the last three texture slots are dependent upon the shader that you will have used. And we'll cover the shaders later on. But I'm going to go ahead and change the emissive color of my orb here. That way I can get some reflectivity from the ground one whatnot. Now, the glow amount, these sliders are really touchy. If you try to hold the mouse up and uh, move the mouse up and down, you'll notice that it jumps from 1 to 200 really quickly. And a lot of times you'll find it's easier to actually just type in the number you want, as it'll eat up some time otherwise. Now, I'm going to add a bump map here, as I found a bump map that I was relatively happy with. We're not going to be using a spec map on this particular object, but the bump map I found is called Concrete Broken. I was wanting more of a water wavy texture. So I'm going to load that in. And you'll notice immediately that the sphere started getting some ridges. It started to look like it was bending the line. And you'll notice that the color on these bump maps are quite a bit different than what you would be expecting. That actually represents the dips and bumps that the material will give. Now, another thing you need to look at is the surface type. Uh, this is important as whenever, say, like a bullet hits the object or it interacts with the environment, this is how the engine knows how that material is supposed to act. I'm going to go ahead and choose water for now. It's not going to really display the water properties, but you'll see later on in the videos what I'm doing with it. Now, another thing to do, like I said in the last video, always be sure to hop in game and check out your new materials. Now, as I walk up on it, you'll see all the little waves and bumps that you may not have been able to see before because I hopped in game and started walking around it. In the next video, we're going to talk a bit more on the aspect of materials called shaders and how they're used. In this video, we're going to be talking about shaders and how they're used to set up a material. Mainly, we're going to be talking about one shader in particular called the illumination shader. Now, I'm going to load up the material that we had created before, and you'll see it has a loom for illumination. And as you hit the drop down, you'll see several other shaders being listed here, such as particles and no draw and sky and sky HDR. All of these have various effects on the object that you're or the material that you're trying to create. But because the illumination shader is used in 95% of all materials, this is what I'm going to talk about. You'll see under shader parameters, you have Fresnel scale, Fresnel power, that's all used for light diffraction. And then if you hit shader generation parameters, you will see even more options, such as spec mask and diffuse alpha, and that's to use the specular map in the alpha channel rather than the opacity. You have environment map, which is used to reflect the environment around on the object. Gloss map and spec alpha works essentially the same as the spec map except for gloss. The glow and the diffuse alpha works essentially the same. It uses the alpha channel to glow on those certain parts. Pretty useful effect. You also have offset bump mapping, which offsets the actual bump map that you use, giving it a bit more depth whenever you look at it. Vertex colors is used to add a bit more depth to your model, but is set up inside of your 3D editor like 3ds Studio Max. Decal, you would check this to turn on the decal option above. You also have parallax occlusion mapping, a displacement mapping, Fong tessellation, and PN triangles tessellation. And these are DirectX 11 features, and if you have got the card, you can use them. Displacement mapping pretty much allows for the opposite of a bump map, while Fong and PN triangle tessellation increases essentially the poly count virtually on the model to give it a bit more smoother look. Dirt layer also works kind of like the decal, except it uses the custom that I was referring to earlier to give it a, another texture on top of the material. Blend layer works essentially the same thing. And you also have the detail mask and diffuse alpha, which, just like the others before, gives you the detail map in the alpha channel of the texture rather than putting it into one of the special slots. The shader generation parameters are going to be different for each shader that is selected. They all have their own settings that you can choose. You'll notice as I go through and pick random materials that most of them use the same shader as the illumination shader. It's essentially the default. It gives you the best effects for most objects. You'll notice as you get to some other objects such as light beams and light flares that it uses some other shaders. 
water and a few other things like skies use some other shaders, but most of the time the illumination shader is going to be what's used. And the only thing that you're going to really have to worry about is you're creating objects level to actually interact with the player. In the next video, I'm going to show you how to manipulate these textures even further. In the last video of this section, we're going to talk about some of the more advanced settings for your texture. You'll find that whenever you create a texture, sometimes you can't just create a material, apply a texture, and slap it on an object and everything will look good. Sometimes it just won't line up. So, in order to fix a lot of those problems, you're going to want to drop down the arrow next to the diffuse map, and then drop down the arrow next to tiling. What this does is uh, it allows you to change the tiling settings of the texture on the material itself. Right now it's set to a one-to-one, -one, essentially a one-by-one -one box. And now you'll notice as I increase the tiling for the vertical, it will increase the amount of times that the texture is layered inside of the material. And you'll see up in the preview that it even shows you what it looks like as well as inside of the editor. You can do the same for the U, but it's really hard to tell on this particular model as it just rotates along the bottom. You can do the same with offsetting the actual texture or rotating it around any given axis. Now, if you drop down the oscillator, this allows you to move the material on the object itself. If you drop down where it says no change, and I'll pick constant moving, and then you have to change both the rate, the phase, and the amplitude to get any type of visual effect. But as soon as you do, you'll notice how it starts to oscillate around the object. Now the same is possible for the other axis. However, once again on this particular model, you're not gonna be able to tell a whole lot, but I'll still change it just so you can see. You'll notice how it continues to move. Now you can do this with various things, such as the bump map, the spec, the glow, and decals, which when you start to apply this to some of the other texture maps, such as decal and glow, you start to get some pretty nice effects within the level without having to do a whole lot of work in other tools like 3ds Max or Photoshop, and it saves you quite a bit of time in the process. In the next section, we're going to talk about the flow graph and how to write short, simple scripts. In this section, we're going to be discussing flow graphs. Flow graphs add logic to the game world and allow somebody that doesn't know any type of programming or scripting to actually add logic like a script to the game. To open up the flow graph editor, you're going to want to go up to view, open view pane, and then click on flow graph. You'll notice that you'll have a blank gray screen in the middle and you'll have a tree off to the left. First, we need to actually create our first flow graph. So go up to file and then click on new. And you'll see underneath files on the left hand side, it adds a default and then it adds a grid in the gray box in the middle. The first thing we want to go ahead and do is rename our flow graph. I'm going to name this just test FG. Hit OK. And then select it again. And now we're able to start work within our flow graph. The most commonly used flow node is going to probably be the add start node. And you'll notice that there's a bunch of other nodes here, and we'll eventually try to cover as many as we can. But the add start node here, and you can zoom in and out using your scroll wheel, as you can see it's sometimes needed. But you'll see it has inputs and outputs. And these particular inputs and outputs are called Boolean inputs and outputs, meaning that they put out a 1 or a 0. Another commonly used node that has a unique feature is going to be the key node. This allows the player to direct in a key or mouse click of any nature and assign a script to it. And as you can tell, you can double click on key and I'll just put W here. To link these nodes together though, you need to drag a mouse between the output of one node to the input of another. And if you mess up, you can right click on the dot in the middle and then click on remove and that'll remove the line. But you can drag more than one output to more than one input. With these arrows connected, you can drag the nodes around and the arrows will stay connected to the node itself. This allows you to get larger and larger scripts and manage the nodes a bit easier. You're going to have to find a way to keep these arrows untangled per se. 
You'll notice as you go to the Add Node feature whenever you right click, there are a lot of different sections. Each section has to do with a different part of the engine, such as physics, or entities, or vectors. And you'll go through, and as you use them, you'll eventually learn what each one does. I can't possibly go through every single one of these in these videos. Another very useful tool, though, whenever you're working with flow graphs, is the ability to add comment boxes. If you click on Add Comment and Add Simple Comment, this allows you to place a text field essentially in the middle of the flow graph. And I'll put Example FG here. And as you can see, it puts it in a white box that can then be also be dragged around. As your scripts grow, you're going to have bunches of nodes that will connect with each other, and you'll want to use these comment boxes to keep track of what's what. Another useful t thing to know, though, is that these flow graphs don't save automatically. You'll have to save them yourself before you close out. So go up to Save. And I'm going to save mine in the level directory. And as you can see, I'll delete the graph out of our editor here. And then open it back up through the saved one that we had just made. And as you can see, it appears just like we had made it. Next, I'm going to show you how easy it is to make a functional flow graph that can be used in-game. Now that you've familiarized yourself with the flow graph editor, I'm going to show you how to create a functional flow graph script that tracks the player in the world coordinate system. First, go up to View, Open View Pane, and then open up the flow graph. And then if you click on the plus next to Files, you should see your old flow graph sitting there. But we need to create a new one. So go up to File, click on New, and then immediately rename it. I'm going to call this one just Player Location. Once you have it named, go ahead and click on it again to work on it. And then first and foremost, we need to add the start node. That way the script starts whenever the level starts. And then go to Add Node, HUD, and Display Debug Message. Now while this necessarily shouldn't be used in game, this is very helpful for debugging levels. Next, we want to go ahead and add the Get Position for the entity. And then we will link the player location with that. We'll also need a time node here. And I will show you how to use this in a second. Just need to add a couple of other nodes here. We'll go to game and then local player. And what this does is it continuously updates the script with the local player's entity. ID, which we'll use to track everything with. Now you'll notice as I mouse over a lot of different nodes, you'll see pop-ups come up. For instance, the green is any, which means that it can be triggered on any input. You'll see a red, which is an integer, which is just one, two, three, four, five, six, with no decimals. You'll have a vector, which gives you x, y, z coordinates. You'll also notice under the right-click menu that they're named a little bit differently. They're also called vec3. Uh, but they're the exact same thing. Uh, you'll also have the float, which allows you to input any number, like 2.8, 5.6, it doesn't matter. First, let's go ahead and try to get this script to set up a little bit. We're going to go ahead and drag the tick over to get from the time node to entity get position. That way, every frame, it tries to get the position of the local player and it knows what the local player is by this game local player node that we drag over to the input entity. And from the start of the game, we need to update the game local player node with the current entity ID of the local player. We'll also want the debug message to show at the beginning of the level as well. What, and we need to pick what we need it to show. So we'll use this get position, and we'll drag the position to the message. So it'll output the position of vec three coordinates as the message in the debug display. You'll notice as we go through, it follows fairly logical. The arrows and the nodes allow you to create a fairly complex script relatively quickly. Now at the same time, you may also notice that using this flow graph system may complicate writing a script, making it take a little bit longer. But if you have no programming experience, this is a really good way to get started in developing logic for the level of your game.
I'm going to go ahead and create a comment here. It's always a good idea to create comments for every single script, so you don't have to try to look through and figure out what it does by just trying to follow the arrows. And as always, we'll want to go ahead and save. And I will save this under my Levels folder. And once it's saved, you're good to go. We'll go ahead and close out the flow graph and hop again. And you'll notice in the upper right, it actually displays the world coordinates. Now you'll see quite a few decimal places. Uh, you don't necessarily need to be that precise at any given point, but it's there if you need it. And now that you know how to interact a little bit with the player character, in the next video I'm going to show you how to get logic to work with some of the objects inside of your level. In this video, I'm going to show you how to manipulate objects in the game world using the flow graph and binding it to a key press so you can affect it as the player in the level. First, I'm going to go ahead and drag in the high poly sphere that we had put into the editor a while back. And then we're going to open up the flow graph. And then we need to go ahead and disable the other flow graphs that you have active at the moment. If you're following along with the videos, you just should just have two down there. And then we need to go ahead and create a new flow graph. And then rename it. I'm going to call this one Material Change. And then hit OK and select your flow graph. And I'm going to keep this particular flow graph relatively small so you can see how quickly and easily you can add logic to your level. But once we get your start node put in, I'm going to add a entity and the material node. This allows you to use or reference the material that is on a specific entity. And we're going to put another node in called input key. This is the one I had showed you earlier. And this is it. This is all we need for it for now. But you'll see a red bar here under entity material. First, go ahead and make sure you have the entity that you put into the level selected. And then right click on the node and select assign selected entity. And this will put that particular entity in there and it will always be set as that. And then as the output, we're going to go ahead and reset this so it starts off like it should. And then we'll drag the pressed to set. And I'm going to set this to just one. So whenever I hit key one, it's going to set this material that we're going to pick here. If you double click it, you'll get the three dots like you would in other material reference editors. And then we're, I'm just going to select the test material that I had made earlier. And we're going to hit the little triangle and you should see it add to the node. And that is all we need for this particular flow graph. Now, just like always, remember to save it before you do anything else. And to keep everything together, I'm going to go ahead and save mine in the levels folders. And then once it's saved, that's all we need for now. So go ahead and hop in game. And then as you can see, whenever we hop in, it resets the material at the start of the level. And then whenever I press one, changes the material. And now that you know how to manipulate objects with the flow graph, in the next video, I'm going to show you how to do the same thing, but using an event instead of a key press. In this video, I'm going to show you how to take the material change script that you had made in the last video and use a proximity trigger to trigger it instead of a key. This is good because you can run checkpoints and cinematics and whatnot off the proximity trigger. First, we need to put a proximity trigger into the level. So go to Entity and select the proximity trigger. Now you can place it in the level and it'll just be a, a regular cube. And you'll have to adjust the size of the cube to encompass the area that you want the player to trigger. So whenever they walk into this box, it will then send a signal down the flow graph that we're about ready to create. I'm going to put it around the sphere that we have in the level here. So whenever you, the player gets close to it, it'll activate. Now that we got that placed, keep it selected. Uh, and then go to Flow Graph. And then we need to make sure that you have a material change disabled. But go to New, and we will rename this. I'm going to call this Proximity Material Change. And then hit OK. And we need to go to the material change script that we had created before. 
and we're going to go ahead and copy it. So just drag a box around the entire thing, right click on any of the nodes, and then select copy. Now there's two different forms of paste. Whenever you get to the new script, you can either do paste or paste with links. Uh, if you do just paste, it'll put it in here without any arrows at all. You don't want to do that. Just go ahead and delete that and right click, hit paste with links, and it'll add all of the arrows that you need. We need to go ahead and get rid of this input key so we, the one will no longer trigger the material change. And then after you get the input key disabled, make sure that you have that proximity trigger box selected. And then right click anywhere in the flow graph. And then instead of going to add node, we're going to go to add selected entity. And this will put in the node for the proximity trigger. So we need to connect this up real quick. We're going to have the start node enable the proximity trigger. So whenever the level starts, the proximity trigger will be enabled. And then on the output, you can tell whether or not the proximity trigger is enabled, disabled, whether or not somebody has entered, what faction or team that the player belongs to, whether or not they're inside or they've left. Go ahead and drag an arrow from enter. So when the player enters the proximity trigger, it will go to set and set that material. And as always, we need to go ahead and remember to save. If you ever forget to save and you exit out of the, the CryEngine, you will lose your flow graph, so you've got to remember to do this. And then once you have it saved, we'll go ahead and hop in game and make sure it works. Go ahead and run into the proximity trigger. And the material changes. And like I said, this is good for creating cinematics, say when a player runs down a road and a building's about to fall, but it, you only want it to fall when the player gets there. You, that's where you would use this. Next, I'm going to show you how to start animating these objects using the flow graph. In this video, we're going to expand upon the script that you had created in the last video, adding extra functionality such as animation and movement. To do that, go ahead and open up the flow graph editor. And then make sure that you have the scripts that you created in the last video loaded up. And then we'll go ahead and create yet a new script. We'll want to rename this. We'll just name this Movement and Material Change. And hit OK. And then we are going to copy and paste all of the nodes from the proximity material change script and then paste them in the material and movement change script. One thing to remember is to disable the scripts that you had made in previous videos or whenever you were playing around so they don't interfere with your current script thinking that you're making you think that you're doing something wrong. But in order to proceed on this, we need to add a couple more nodes. We're going to go ahead and add a movement node. And we're going to add move entity 2. We'll set that aside. And then we need to add a, another node, Entity, and then Get Position. Okay, and then one thing we got to do is be sure that we have the object selected that we want to move. Now, one thing to remember, while you can load most entities as Entity ID inside of the node, not all entities have the ability to load their own node, such as we did with the proximity trigger. One other thing that you can also do to make things a little bit easier for you is to hide proximity triggers so you can select the objects beneath as they can get in the way whenever you're trying to work with your level. But go ahead and assign the geometric entity or the sphere inside of entity get position. And then we want to assign an entity to move entity to. And we're going to go ahead and assign the same sphere to that as well by right clicking and selecting assign selected entity. I also dragged an arrow from the start to the get on get position. That way as soon as it starts the level it will get the position of the sphere. We need to add another node however in order to have it actually move anywhere. So we need to go to vec3 and then add vec3. Essentially we will have the position going into A and it will move by 12 
units and then add the two together essentially and if you hold your mouse over the output you'll see where it says a plus b that equals out and then we'll drag an arrow to the destination on the move entity two dynamic update what that means is that it will dynamically update the actual destination while the entity is in movement we need to increase the speed a little bit so it actually goes somewhere Ease distance determines how fast it will actually achieve the speed that you had set in the option before. And then you have your start and stop function. What we will do is we will have it set up so that whenever the player leaves the proximity trigger, the sphere will start to rise. We'll drag the leave to start on the move into the two. And then whenever the player enters the proximity trigger, it'll stop moving. And that's essentially all we needed. You just got to remember that adding the VEC3 is in an XYZ system. So you need to keep that in mind as it works off world coordinates, not local player coordinates. And remember, we need to save the flow graph. And it should be essentially ready to try to run. Let's go ahead and hop in game. And then we will make our way over to the proximity trigger and the material changes and as we leave the proximity trigger it starts to move and whenever we enter again it stops as you can see as you move back and forth it'll stop and start overall one thing you need to keep in mind whenever you're playing around with the flow graph is that there is no true set way to create a script there are numerous ways you can move this sphere up or down or change the material just like i did let me go ahead and show you one of my more complex scripts that I created. Now you see how many nodes it has. It, as you start to expand on your scripts, it does start to get a bit more complex and how you choose to keep everything organized is completely up to you. But you'll notice how I have a lot of comments throughout the entire script to try to keep track of what does what as I make a lot of changes to this often. And with that, we move on to the next section where we dive into the particle editor. This is section six of the CryEngine 3 SDK level design course. And in this particular section, we're going to be talking about particles and what they are and how to create them. Particles have a limited lifetime within the game level, meaning that they spawn in temporarily and then come right back out. They also have quite a few other uses. As you can see here in this fire that we're going to be creating throughout the section, this is actually created with nothing but particles. And there's several of them that comprise the entire flame. Like you have the coals down here in the bottom. That is using an actual object inside of the particle. Now that can be done using a standard object with an animated material, but I did it as a particle to kind of give you an idea of the various types. You'll also notice obviously the flames and the smoke and the embers that come off the fire as well, and those are all different types of particles. As for instance, the ember is a static particle, non-animated particle, whereas the flames and the smoke are animated particles, meaning that there's an actual animation itself set up whenever you set up the actual particle. So, inside of your game level, I'm choosing to use this statue that came with the CryEngine 3 SDK, but you can really use anything you want to build a fire inside of, such as a stack of logs or anything like that. But once you have the spot that you want to start creating the fire, go ahead and get zoomed in on it, and then go up to View, Open View Pane, and then Database View. And this is where the particles are actually stored and worked with. Click on the Particles tab here, and it'll open it up in the editor. In the next video, we'll cover the particle editor more in depth, and then we'll start with the coals that you saw in that flame. In this video, we're going to be going into further depth into the particle editor and how it's used to create particles. Finally, we're going to get started on creating that fire. So if you didn't do it in the last video, go to your open view pane and then click on database view. And then click on the particles tab at the top, and this will give you the basic particles view layout. The first thing we need to do is actually create a group and our first particle. I'm going to just call statues fire, considering that all of the particles, like the coals, the embers, the smoke, all fall under this group. And so we need to go through and create each of the actual particles themselves. So I'm going to create embers, and then you need to select statue fire again, and then click on add new item again. And then I will add in flames. And then we also need smoke. And 
Now, one thing you may accidentally do, if you don't click on where it says statue fire, you just leave smoke selected, and then you click on add new item, it will create a child particle underneath the smoke. And as you can see here, the group smoke fire dot smoke, and it'll put it accordingly in the tree. If you do that, just right click it and delete it, and then select statue fire, and then add new item. And we're going to put in coals. The coals is what we're going to be designing in this particular video. You'll find that in a lot of the videos in this particular section, I'm going to speed things up quite a bit because there's just a lot of testing and playing around that needs to be done. So I'm going to go ahead and create a material for the coals. Now you should already know how to do this, but I'm going to just copy a material that's already in the engine that was used for wood, as you can see, and I'm going to put it under the levels directory. That way I can use it and modify it without actually modifying the original material. And then I'll select it and I'll change the colors up a bit to make it look like it's actually on fire. And this material that I just copied slash created is going to be the material that I actually use inside of the particle editor to give it the color that it needs. So with the coal selected, we're going to adjust some settings here. First off, because I'm going to be using a the, what's called river rocks inside of the engine. I'm going to get those loaded up first. And those are under the natural. And rocks. And then river rocks. And I, it doesn't really matter which one. They, I just need the basic shape of them to look like coals. But we're going to be adding a new material, the one that I had just copied, right? And we're going to insert it right here. And just like everywhere else, you're going to click on the three little dots and it'll bring up the material editor. And then I'm going to select my material, and I'm going to hit the arrow to put it into the actual particle editor. Now, it's not going to be really doing much of anything quite yet, because we haven't set up any type of spawn time or spawn delay or anything like that. So let's go ahead and scroll back up to the top here. And then we need to set how many particles will be visible at any given point, and that's done underneath the count multiplier. And I'm going to do just one because I only want one set of coals. And we're going to click continuous, which means that it'll always run. It'll always spawn particles. And the particle lifetime I would normally set because I want this particular particle to stay around during the entire level, I'm going to leave it at zero. When you have appearance under facing, I'm going to set this to free. And what that does makes a difference of whether or not the particle will always face the camera or if it's just going to be free floating as you put it into the level itself. And then whenever you're ready to actually start working with the particle inside the level, all you got to do is drag it from the tree and then drag it into the level. And it'll give you the helpers, as you see, as I'm working with here. Then you need to move the actual particle to where you want it. Now, you'll notice a bug here on mine. You'll see a particle off to the right. A lot of times that can be fixed by going up to tools and then reload objects, but it doesn't always work. I got to set up the orientation and everything, and these particles are, are still a little bit yellow, so I'm going to darken them up a little bit. And then you can increase the size as I did here, and you can see those particles even more evident up to the upper right as well. And it does not look like reloading the geometry is doing much of a difference. So I'm going to get these set where I want, and then I'm going to restart the CryEngine. Yeah, it doesn't seem to be doing it. Uh, but this is something that you come across sometimes when you create particles. That's why I'm leaving it in here. But once you got everything started back up, it should look like normal. There we go. Now we have the coals, but they're rather dull looking. So we need to go into the actual material. And just like I showed you before, we can set up the oscillation and the movement of the material on the actual object itself. Go through here and set this up real quick. And if you're not happy with the way it moves, you can always change the type U or type V type of moving, as I did. And that'll give us the coals that we're going to be working with. Now in the next video, I'm going to show you how to create the actual embers next that come off the flame. In this video, we're going to skip ahead a little bit in the creation of the fire, as I've already created the flames, and you'll see it whenever I decide to move the particle editor. But for now, we're going to work on creating the embers that come off the fire because they're much easier to create and a lot less complex. So to start, we need to come up with the 2D texture. Now, unlike the coals, everything that we create from here on out is going to be 2D with a 3D kind of look. 
and I'll show you how to achieve that once we get a bit further into this video. But the texture that we're going to be using is going to be called flare.dds. It's a really simple texture, but it's going to work perfect for what we need. So we'll go ahead and hit open and load that up, and you'll see here under the texture, that's where it's stored. Now, you'll notice that we leave the model and the material empty because we don't need it. Now, we want to, I'd say, a good 12 embers at any given point that's visible. And continuous, whenever you check that, it will continuously spawn those embers as long as the level exists. And then you have particle lifetime, which is how many seconds the particle will last. And then off to the right, we have movement. And this is how the particle emits from the particle emitter in what direction and at what speed. And you'll notice how I'm putting acceleration in the XYZ, meaning that it's going to shoot off to the left a little bit. Now, the reason for that is to make it look like it's being blown away by the wind. Otherwise, it would just go straight up and not look very realistic at all. Now, you'll notice the flames that I've already got there. Like I said, we'll be making those flames in the next video. But let's drag these embers into the level. And you'll notice they look weird at first, but just like with all particles, they require some tinkering and some tweaking here and there to get it to look right. And then we will move these particles into the right spot. Okay. Looks like it could work. Now we need to get rid of the black background to the particle. So we will get into the particle editor again and move the blend type to additive. Now you see where it says facing. We're going to leave that on camera. As you might have saw with the black background there, it's a Technically a 2D particle. It's just because it's always facing the camera, it's going to appear 3D as you move around. Now we'll change the color of these embers a little bit to make them a bit more realistic. Now they're not really matching with the fire very well. They're kind of flowing off to the left a little bit. So we're going to adjust the movement settings a bit more. And we'll shrink them down a little bit so they look a bit more realistic as well. And then one thing you'll notice is whenever you drop down any of these arrows, you have this graph that moves from left to right. And you can move the dots on it. And you can even double click on the line to create a new dot. This is over the course of the entire particle's lifetime. For instance, in this one, this is adjusting the alpha throughout the particle lifetime, meaning that at the beginning of the particle life, you're not going to see it at all because it's going to be at full alpha and then it'll come as like a bell curve come into appearance and then eventually fade back out so you don't get a really sharp pop ins and pop outs with particles now i'm going to speed things up a little bit while i tweak and adjust settings and get these embers right there we go that looks a bit more real now they're just flying off into the air but it's still in at least one good general direction and this is essentially how you create a very simple static particle. Now, in the next video, I'm going to show you how to create an animated particle, like the flames and smoke where the particle itself moves. Now that you've familiarized yourself with the particle editor, we're going to go into creating more complex particles that have animations built into them. First off, we want to get back into the particle editor, and notice that we're moving backwards a little bit. This is before we created the embers, but after we've created the coals. I created the embers before, like I said, as they're quite a bit less complex. But just like in the one before, we're not going to be using materials or geometry in it. We're just going to be using a static 2D texture. Go ahead and click on the three dots to bring up the file browser. And the texture that we're going to be looking for is underneath sprites. And then we'll move over to flame underscore animation underscore d dot dds and you'll notice that it has a bunch of different frames in it for instance this one has four by two and what you need to do is you need to count how many are in the x-axis which are moving horizontal and then how many are in the y-axis which is moving up and down and then after you count how many up and down there are in the preview go ahead and hit ok to load it up and now we need to set up what's called texture tiling. So drop down this arrow, and it'll give you a bunch of different options. You need to set in how many tiles were along the x-axis, which here was 10, and then how many tiles were along the y-axis, here was 8. You need to set the first tile, which is 1. How many, the variant count, how many different 
animations or how many different frames there are. And then same with the animated frames count. And then you need to actually set up the frame rate, which is how many frames per second it will actually start to play. And then after you've got all this set up, you'll want to drop the animation cycle down to loop so it continues to play, and then animation blend so it blends the, the last frame and the first frame together smoothly. And then we will turn off orient to velocity, which makes the particle face whichever direction it is actually moving, but we want it to face the camera. And we'll turn on continuous because we want this particle to last the entire level. Nine seems to be a decent number for the amount of flames. And then we'll put a particle lifetime to, let's say, three. And then we need to drag it into the level. And then here in a minute, I'm going to go ahead and speed everything up again. As, like I said, going through the particle editor is a lot of trial and error, I find. I'll find that I'll get everything set up the way I want it to look, or I'll have it in my mind the way I'm going to build it. And then when I actually get in here to start creating it, it turns out to work out a little bit different. But you'll notice once you get on the black background, we need to turn the blend type to additive. That essentially tells the engine how it's going to factor in the alpha texture, or the alpha channel of the texture. And we need to get this thing set up at the proper spot. And it looks pretty dinky right now, but you can tell that it has an actual animation. And what it's doing is it's running through that entire list of tiles that we saw. You'll notice that I'm also opening up more of these graphs to map out during the particle lifetime the effects that I want to have on it. This is really useful. Otherwise, you're going to have particles that just seem to instantly pop into existence and then instantly pop out. It can be really distracting when you're actually in-game trying to work. Now, the random offset, what that does is it will spawn the particle at a random position, but given the variables that I'm setting up now, around the actual particle emitter. Now, the particle emitter is essentially the icon, right? In the center of the three helper arrows is the emitter. It doesn't actually have a shape or an actual body. Just know that that is where the particles will be emitting from. So I'm going to go through and tweak these until every particle that spawns is within that bowl that the fire's contained in. But I want it to spawn kind of randomly to give it more of a chaotic look, to give it more of a realistic feel. Now you'll notice how fast the fire is moving right now. This is also because I've got the video sped up. Once I slow it down, it'll start to look like it did in the very first video that we had went through. Now, it may seem pretty complex whenever you watch me create this particle. It seems that there's a lot of settings. Just trust me when I say that a lot of them are pretty self-explanatory, and they'll explain themselves as you go through and try to adjust it. But one good thing that helps is that the fact that the particle is updated in real time. As soon as you adjust something in the particle editor, it affects it in the actual game level. Another thing to keep in mind whenever your particle is actually moving throughout the game world and you set up the movement speed off to the right inside of the particle editor, if you don't specify which axis the particle will move along, as I'm doing under the acceleration, it will move straight up. It looks pretty unrealistic, and it does not look very well. Now, it'll work for some applications, yes, but for the majority of the time, anything that you want to look realistic, you have to actually put in acceleration in certain directions, and or some sort of random multiplier on it that will randomize the, either the spawning or the movement of the particle itself. Now. The flame here looks to be about done after I went through and tweaked everything. And I will also quickly cover the smoke and how that was created as well. Let me adjust a couple more settings to get it to appear a bit more chaotic and look like the wind is blowing it a bit more. I want it to be a nice roaring fire. And that seems like it is working good. And so now we have the flames created. So let's go ahead and skip ahead a little bit and we will create the smoke. Now, I'm going to go ahead and just speak through this as it's essentially created the exact same way as the flames were. Now, you'll also notice whenever I go to actually look at the fire that there are embers there because this is the order that I created them in, essentially. The smoke, because it's usually the last thing created by the particle in real life, it's going to be the last thing I create inside the game level. Now, this is what it will look like if you don't set up the tiling under the animation for the actual 
particle itself. You'll notice that it's got a bunch of different pictures in it, essentially. And you'll notice as I go through and up the tile count and give it the right settings, it goes down to a single cloud like it should. Overall, though, whenever you're creating these textures, one thing to keep in mind is that there is no real wrong way to do it. As long as it looks good and you achieve the desired result, it doesn't matter if you put a little bit too much alpha into it and compensate it by another way, or if you had it moving in slightly the wrong direction. Usually when it comes to particles, particles create things that are slightly chaotic by nature. So it doesn't necessarily have to be perfect. Now, as you'll notice, I'm getting the smoke to fill out a bit more. It's starting to look much more like smoke than what I originally drug it in here. But we're going to tweak a bit more settings so it doesn't pop in and pop out real hard. And so it blends in to the environment. And I'm going to add some random modifiers. Now this random that I'm adjusting underneath the size and underneath the stretch, that is available through most of the settings. So you could randomize any of the given settings. Now in the next videos, we're going to discuss lighting with these particles. In the last video of this section, we're going to cover how to use particles to light your level. You may notice that now that you've got your fire complete, it just doesn't look right. It doesn't interact with its surroundings all that great. And that's because we don't have any lighting set up. So the first thing I'm going to go ahead and do, as my level is going to take place at night, I'm going to go ahead and switch it to night. That way I can get the proper lighting that I would want in the setting that I would want. So we're going to turn this to zeros, which is essentially midnight. And the level is now dark, but still doesn't quite look right, as I have a sky texture put in from whenever I was making a previous video for you. So I need to go ahead and change that sky texture so I can get proper darkness in the level. And if you remember, you go back over to the environment tab in the roll-up bar and you can change that. I'm just going to change it back to sky, as sky is the material that is natively used that changes with the level. There we go. Now it is a proper dark. So now that we can tweak the lighting on the particle itself and it'll show it properly on the object surrounding it. One thing that really helps whenever you try to do lighting for your particles is to try to keep it in view inside of the view pane while you're messing with the particle itself. That way you can, as you make adjustments to the sliders, you can actually see it in real time how it changes. The lighting can be kind of misleading sometimes whenever you're trying to set it up. So inside of the particle editor, scroll all the way down on the left hand side and you should see a lighting section. Now the diffuse backlighting, emissive lighting, and emissive HDR dynamic, those are mainly for how the fire is going to look. As you notice as I add one to each of those, it brightens up. Now that's not actually emitting light on anything else, it is just lighting up the entire level. And then you need to drop down at the arrow for light source and add a radius. This is where the light is going to fall off, essentially a sphere around the particle emitter. And then you need to up the intensity, and that's what actually gives the particle brightness. So we'll up the radius to 100, and then we'll up the intensity to something fairly low. We'll put it up at 2 or 3. And you'll notice as I slowly slide it up, the entire area starts to light up. Now the radius on this is a little high, as you can see it's going all the way down to the beach, and it's not something I really want. So I'm going to drop this radius back down, we'll put it to 50, so it doesn't actually reach the beach on the ground. And as you can tell in the statue, as you move around, as the particle actually gets emitted, it will change the lighting on the statue itself. The lighting on the statue is also determined by the reflectivity of the statue but that is covered in an earlier section under materials. Another thing that you may notice under the lighting tab is the receive and cast shadows. Obviously there's not going to be a whole lot inside of a fire that's going to be receiving shadows, although that's checked by default, and there's nothing really up here that's going to cast a shadow on it. But you definitely want fire itself to cast shadows. Now the coals that I am adjusting as of right now don't necessarily need to cast shadows. Now, you could probably even get away without any coals whatsoever, as the player's probably never going to see them unless it's in some sort of a flyby or some sort of an animation like that. But I'm trying to make it a nice complete fire so you can see everything with it. That being said, there's no need for it to cast shadows, but we're going to go ahead and get the lighting on it and everything set up so it lights up the inside of this bowl. 
Now in the next section, we're going to be talking about adding sound and music to your game. In section 7 of this course, we're going to be discussing how to set up audio inside of the engine. Specifically, first here, we're going to be learning how to set up the music for the level. To view the music and set up entire lists, you're going to want to go up to View, Open View Pane, and back to the Database View. If you click on the top next to Particles, there's Music. And you can see a list of music that's here already loaded in the editor. If you click on something and then hit Play, you can hear what it sounds like. And this is what I'm going to use for the background music of my level. If you'd like to see how Crytek sets up one of their musical scores for one of their levels, we can load up a sample list that they gave us. If you go to Open File, you can go down to Music, SDK underscore Music and hit OK, and that'll bring up the playlist that they created for the forest level that they have loaded preemptively onto the engine. Now you can go through and click, and you'll see it's composed of various layers. These layers are, say, if you're sneaking around, you're going to have more of a nice, calm type of music captured, or if you get sighted, you're going to have some sort of an alert-based music. Uh, and when you're fighting, you're going to have more of a vigorous, fast-paced music, and this editor allows you to set it up accordingly. I'm going to go ahead and delete everything that's up there, and we're going to create our own theme. And we're going to rename this theme. And usually, the main theme has the same title as the level that you're putting it in. It doesn't have to, but that's usually the way it's set up. And then we're going to put in a new mood. As I said, moods have different scores based on them. They have different pieces of music. And we're just going to fill the main layer. We're not going to worry about the incidental or the end layer. And we're going to rename this pattern. We're going to call it main pattern. And this will be referenced later whenever we write the flow graph for it. And then after you get this renamed, you can come up here to the top and point it towards the piece of music that you want. As I said, I'm going to be going with 01 underscore relaxed. And hit open. There's some other variables here, such as volume and fade in and fade out points that you can set up. But we're just going to leave everything as the default value for now. And that is all you should have to do inside of the database editor. Now let's go ahead and open up the flow graph and we have to tell it to actually play the music. So go up to File New and rename your flow graph. Level music should be fine enough. Hit OK. And then we're going to select it and add a start node. And then we're going to music and play pattern. And that's really all we need for this particular flow graph. We just got to set up the play pattern node. So on the output of the start, drag it to play. So that way the music plays as soon as the level starts. And then we need to point it towards a pattern. And this is that main pattern that we had just made in the database view. And that's it. Go ahead and save it. And as usual, I'm going to go ahead and save mine in the levels folder for now. And that's all we need. Go ahead and hop into the game and let's see if our music plays. Now that we have the music for our level set up and seems to be working, we can go ahead and move on to the sound effects portion. And in the next video, I'm going to show you how to set these sound effects up based on locations in the world. Here we're going to cover setting up sound effects for your environment. For instance, the pond that we had built earlier in the videos, we're going to put a pond noise to it essentially. So whenever you get close to it, it sounds like that there's a pond there. To preview the sounds that are available that you've either loaded into the editor or ones that are already there, you can go up to Sound and then Sound Browser. I found one already.
It's going to be called lake underscore calm. If you hit play, it sounds like a lake. And we can exit out of this. Then we have to set up the boundaries from where the sound will actually be playing from. So go up to area and then click on shape. And make sure that your follow terrain icon at the top is clicked so that way these dots get placed on the terrain. But we're going to zoom way out so we can encompass our lake and then just start to place dots around the lake. If you don't see anything, make sure you hit that box at the top right. But it will essentially draw out a multi sided polygon around the boundary. You'll see what I mean as I finish tracing this around. This doesn't have to be perfect by any means. It just has to encompass the area in which you're wanting the sound to originate from. And whenever you're getting ready to place your last dot, just double click and it will finish the shape. Now this area in its own right does not really do much of anything. We have to link something to it. So the next thing we have to bring out is a sound. So go to sound and then bring out ambient volume. And you can ignore this sphere. We're going to essentially be replacing the sphere with the shape that we had just created. Another thing that really helps in keeping track of all these sounds at right level is if you place the sound icons up high above everything else. That way you can tell what they are right off the bat. But once again, this in its own right doesn't do a whole lot for you. So we need to link this sound effect to the shape that we had just made. Before we do that, we need to actually place in the sound that we want to hear. That's going to be this lake calm. And then you need to select the shape that you had just traced. And then scroll to the very bottom of the roller bar until you see a white box where it says target. Select the pick button right below that. And then select the sound effect. And that will place a blue line between the two signifying that they're linked. And you'll see it show up in the box at the bottom. I'll have to highlight it so you can see it a little bit better. There you go. And once it's in there, that means it's linked. And that is all we're going to end up having to do. Now let's go ahead and find a good spot to hop into the game. And the sound effect should start playing once we get closer. Ah! And in the next video, I'm going to show you several other ways to create noise. In this video, we're going to discuss alternate ways of playing sound in your level. For instance, there are things that you want played throughout the entire level, different ambient sound effects that you would hear in a jungle that would always be audible no matter where you're at. Or maybe other sounds that you would want to play once, say during a cinematic or during a certain event that happens whenever you come across in your level. So first, we want to drag a sound event spot icon into the level from the sound side of the roll-up bar. Once we have the sound set up, we're going to set up a few values here. For instance, on the sound event spot, I'm going to use this dragon cry underscore zero. It'd be a nice ominous thing to hear when you're running through a jungle. Now, you'll see a max wait time and a min wait time. This is the amount of time it takes before each time the sound plays. For instance, the maximum I want to have to wait before I hear that dragon again is going to be 50 seconds, and the minimum that I want to have to wait is going to be 20 seconds. You'll also notice that there is a checkbox there that says once. If you only want the sound to play once, you can click that and that's what it'll do. Make sure to also click play or else when you get into your level, it's not going to really do anything. Now, another thing that we want to go ahead and set up is ambient noise. Like, for instance, the bugs and birds and everything that you would hear in the background. If you go to the sound browser, I've already got something in mind that I'm going to use under forest or under, under jungle and then jungle overview ambience. Pretty much sounds like something you would hear in a jungle. So we want to go ahead and set this up via flow graph. And we're going to set this up on the same flow graph that we have the music set up, just to try to keep things nice and tidy. We're going to add a sound node, just play sound. And then we want this 
to start playing at the beginning of the level. And then there's an entity in which the sound has to be played upon. And so, just so we can hear it no matter where we go, we're going to be putting in the local player node. So it always plays on our character. We'll drag an arrow from that to Entity. And then we need to select the actual sound to play. So double click that and it'll bring you up to the sound browser, which I've already got it selected. And it'll put it into the node and it'll alter the size of the node so you can see the entire file path. And we're going to check Loop so that way it keeps playing over and over. And then you'll see that there's other things like a volume or inner and outer radius in which you want it to be played. But we're going to go ahead and save that. And then we're going to hop into the game and we're going to make sure that everything that we have set up, including music and other sound effects, work. And as you can tell, with proper music and sound effects, it can really alter the dynamic of a level and make it appear more alive. Now in the next section, we're almost there. We can pack everything up and start to play our level for the first time. At some point during the creation of your level, you're going to want to take a step back and debug what you currently have. It's good to do that at several points throughout the creation of the level, as you don't want to wait to get to the very end to try to debug everything, as it can overwhelm you quickly. One of the best things to help you debug it as you go is this console bar here at the bottom. Now, this displays both level errors and editor errors, which are two very different things. The editor isn't really used during the actual gameplay, so those won't affect the game at all, but the actual level errors will. So you want to be on top of that. Another thing that will help you out quite a bit is by saving the level statistics. Check object positions and check level for errors. Whenever you do the check level for errors, it'll bring up a list essentially of all the errors that are generated by both editor or the level. And it tells you here what it's generated by. You can also right click on any of these and you can either email them or save them to an Excel sheet or copy it to the clipboard so you can put it in your best text editor. That way you can make a checklist of all the different things that need to be debugged and at what point they will be debugged. Another area that you're going to find yourself having problems in when it comes to debugging is going to be the flow graph editor. I'm going to show you a nice little tool inside of the flow graph editor that's going to help you severely when it comes to actually debugging. It's this little button up top, the little bug. If you check that and you have the flow graph in view whenever you hop in game, it will show you what part of the script is being activated at what point. And if you have numerical values in there, it'll fill in the actual numbers that's being displayed at that script or at that node at the exact moment that the character is actually activating it. And you'll see here that the yellow arrows light up. Now, let's go ahead and get out of the engine for a second. And I'm gonna take a look at the actual files inside of the game directory. You're gonna have several in here that's gonna help you immensely when it comes to debugging. Especially if the editor itself is crashing because of something you did, you have three files to refer to. You have an error.bitmap, an error.dump, and an error.log, all of which will help you figure out what exactly is going on. Now, you also have a game.log and a game level load time.log. And the game.log is actually essentially created whenever you hit Control G and hop into the game. And the game level load time essentially just tells you how many seconds it takes to. Load, some, load up the level that you had created. While all this is useful, the best thing to do is keep an eye on the console and try to squash any bugs as they come up and as you encounter them. In the next video, I'm going to show you how to get the last couple frames per second out of your level before we pack it up. In this video, we're going to be talking about the frames per second that are being achieved in your level as you go and venture through the level and you go from start to beginning. Now, the biggest thing that you have at your disposal, the best tool you have is this frames per second meter that tells you what frames per second you're getting as they're moving. You also got things like your poly count and what kind of shadows you have it set at and everything else, and as well as your camera position and angle. 
But notice how I pan across the floor and vegetation of the level, how the frames per second really takes a dip. And that's pretty common to see, and that's because Flora uses up a lot of memory in order to run, and there's a lot of little animations such as the bending you have in trees and how the leaves move, and all of that really starts to take a, a hit on your performance. Keeping that in mind, you can do the save level statistics that I showed you in the last level, and what it does is it creates a couple files here under test results that give you a lot of information about what is loading in the level and how. Another thing you have is that other file that I showed you, the game level load time log. It essentially tells you how long it takes to load up all the materials and load up all of the objects inside of your level. Now I'm going to move over to one of the more densely populated areas. One of the areas that has a lot of plants and vegetation laying around. And as I travel further and further into it, take a look at the frames per second as it drops. And there's several things that can be done about this. I, you'll notice all these little plants in the back. They're supposed to be green, but in my level currently they're white. That's because they're using what's called sprites. And sprites are a good way to help save on memory. Essentially, it takes the 3D object of the plant and condenses it down to a 2D object at a distance using LODs or level of distance. And you can see there are several other options in here, like cast shadow, receive shadow. Those are really heavy hitting options as well. And then you also have the level of distance draw ratio, the max view distance. And then the use sprites here. This, notice how I uncheck it, all of those white things go away in the background, but they go back to a 3D model that uses up a bit more memory. Now, the reason why they're white is because there's not technically any good sprite for the engine to refer to, and so there's no color for it to draw upon. But had there be, you would notice a nice increase in frames while still looking green and nice in the back. Now another really heavy hitting part of any given level is water. So you need to be sure to keep in mind that there are reflections on water that can affect your game performance. Now in the next video, we're gonna pack up the level and play it for the first time. This is the last video, CryEngine 3 SDK level design course. And here we're gonna pack up your level that you've been working on this whole time and play it inside the launcher for the very first time. First thing we need to do though, is load in some point that our character will spawn at. And so you go to multiplayer and then spawn point. It does say multiplayer under the category it's in, but this is still the spawn point you would use. It's also pretty easy to tell where that spawn point is actually facing and what direction you'll be facing. Now go ahead and save your level. Make sure to always do that before you do anything strange or different. And then go to file and then export to engine. And what this does is it essentially packs up the level into a single file for you. And if you go to your level directory, it's created a folder called, well, in my case, level1.pack. I'll show you here. Right here, level.pack, amongst everything else here. This is what the launcher will use to actually play your level with instead of all the rest of the info here. So let's go ahead and go to the proper bin folder, either 32 or 64, and then let's load the launcher. It's still going to have you log in like you would through the editor, and it's going to give you the engine's basic menu here. Now this can be changed, but that would be an entire course all on its own in changing the HUD and using all the flash elements, learning action scripts to do all this. But go ahead and click on single player, and then click on your level, in my case level 1, and then hit load at the bottom. And you can just sit back and enjoy it and play the level that you just created. done just hit escape and then hit exit game and it'll exit the launcher and go back to the main menu and then actually hit exit at the bottom to exit the program completely now this is by no means a comprehensive list of everything you need in order to complete a game but if you get stuck or have any questions or have any problems come on over to crydev.net and ask around in the forums and we can help you out
My name is Nick Floyd, and I hope you enjoyed this course.